grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that your name, your character, your person would be holy here on earth as it's already holy in heaven, that we would believe your holy word and live holy lives according to it, according to the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going Hebrews 8 through 10, you know, rapidly coming to a close. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, looking ahead to this week, uh, you know, I quick read over chapters 8 through 10, and I go, oh, hey, you know, uh, there's kind of just a, a simple concept here uh, that we can discuss in like five minutes, and you go home with, you know, one clear idea of what God is up to. Uh, and then I and then I actually started reading eight through ten and trying to put it together. And and it's one of those things where Hebrews is so amazing. There's some stuff that just right on the surface that is so beautiful, so good, and you just kind of bask in the glory of God and His goodness. Uh, and, and then you start studying a little bit deeper, and you you end up going, um, <clears throat> uh, what is he talking about? Uh, and so uh, I, I appreciate the next four hours that you've given to me. I, I'm trying to cram all of this in to the next four hours. <laughs> so, so you know, it's not going to be five minutes. It's not going to be four hours. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'll try to, you know, cram this into 20, 25 minutes. But this is, by the way, why, uh, why we read God's word on our own. And then why we get together during the week to discuss what God is saying to us in his word uh, so that we can go deeper into who God is and what God has done for us in Jesus. Uh, so a uh, brief background. Um, oh, wait. Uh, so. OK, here's where I'm starting. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters. Since we have confidence to enter into the holy places, to enter into God's presence by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ooh, it's one of those, you close your eyes and you hear the angels sing. Oh, it is so glorious. It is so good. Such good stuff. Uh, 1022, let us draw near with a true heart and faith. Full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And again, you hear the angels sing, oh, that's kind of pathetic angels, but you're, you're with me. Uh, you know, and uh, 1024, love this verse. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. And you go, hey, this is life application. I'm going to stop my message right now, and we're just going to spend the next four hours just discussing with one another, considering, hey, how can we prompt each other, encourage one another, build up one another, you know, spur one another on toward love and toward good works that God has appointed before us? Uh, that's what we're going to do, so I'm just going to shut up right just now. Uh, but no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, we we are not to neglect meeting together. And, and here's one of those funny things, because, you know, I, I do this for a living, and sometimes people point that out. You know, it's like, Pastor, I can't do this full time. But I, I get the impression in the early church, you know, they would meet basically all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And then after work, they would meet again and discuss because apparently they didn't have internet back in and they had nothing else to do except talk about God and the things of God, you know, but we have internet now, so we, we don't need that. They didn't even have television. I mean, how archaic is that? I, they probably didn't even have radio. <laughs> Imagine that. Whew, crazy talk. Uh, and so he says, you know, meet together. You know, how often are we to meet together? And he says, encourage one another. And this is my favorite word in the whole Bible. I kind of have, you know, three or four favorite word, um, a favorite, three or four that are my favorite word in the Bible. And this is one of them. 
This is such an amazingly awesome word. Uh, it's hard to translate because it's, you know, it's encouragement when encouragement is needed. It's comfort when comfort is needed. It's, it's a hug when a hug is needed. It's a listening ear when uh, listening is needed. It, it's advice when advice is needed. It's a kick in the butt when a kick in the butt is needed. It's, you know, it gives a person exactly what that person needs because you so love and so understand that person that you know to give them exactly what that person needs. I love this word because it's what I need. And all the more because the day is coming. The day of judgment is coming uh, and we want to stand on the day of judgment. So, hey, let's encourage each other. Let's build each other. Let's spur each other on toward love and good works. Now, if this is what the whole book is all about, and you know, I think as Westerners, we're like, we glom onto this part and we go, this is what it's all about. You know, so just cut out everything from 1, 1 through, you know, 10, 18, and just kind of throw that out and everything after this, just kind of throw all that out too. And just, let's just focus here on 10, um, 19 through, I don't know, the next 10, 15 verses, whatever it is, but he doesn't do that. Why does he spend, why does he spend a few chapters talking about why it was necessary for the Messiah to be a human being. And then he spends several chapters, and these chapters kind of overlap, you know, several chapters of why Jesus had to be, why the king, the Messiah had to be human, and then several chapters overlapping on top of that, why the Messiah had to die. Now, you know, I, I think all of us, you know, from Sunday school, uh, you know, if I if I ask you, why did Jesus have to be a human? You're like, well, duh, of course he had to be human. And, and then you, you you say, you know, well, why did Jesus have to die? And it's like, well, duh, of course he had to die. Now, now that's good. That's good. If, if that's your response, that, that's a good thing. Uh, but, but there's a big difference between a childlike faith and an immature child-ish faith. Uh, and and it's fine to have a childish faith uh, when you're a child, uh, but you know, as he said in chapter six, you know, by by this time you should be mature in your faith, and you should be teaching others uh, that there's more to it than just Jesus had to be human. Duh, Jesus had to die on the cross. Duh, there's more to it, uh, and so uh, this is a concern I have. Uh, I wish I had a Bible handy, but take your Bible and, and go from Genesis through Malachi and, and hold that part up, you know, hold that part up and, and then grab the New Testament, hold that part up and you compare the two. And, and what I've seen a lot of Western Christians do, and, and it's really disappointing when I see Lutherans do this, and, and we take that first two thirds of the Bible and we just kind of go and we throw it out. It's like... Here is God's revelation of himself in history to God's people, Israel. And it's like, yeah, that's old. Old things are bad. Throw them out. You know, throw it out. God revealed himself, but now he's revealed himself through Jesus. So just give me Jesus. And that's it. I, I, I don't need to know the rest of the story. I don't need to know the backstory. I don't know, need to know Jesus' history. So just that first two thirds of the Bible, just throw that out. Let's just ignore that. It's like, what? what really? You know, uh, my little joke is uh, that that's like me saying, and note how immature this is. You know, my wife did not come into existence uh, until I met her. Uh, you know, when she was whatever it was, um, 18, 19 years old. You know, she did not exist before then. She just kind of popped into existence when I met her, you know. Uh, she has no history, no background. It's just uh, that that's kind of what 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 you're like if you throw out the Old Testament. N now, it's interesting because uh, the word the 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 book of Hebrews has the word better. And uh, it has the word better more times than all the rest of the New Testament combined. The Old Covenant was good. The New Covenant is better. And if you really want to understand the New Covenant, you really got to understand 
the old covenant? Do you really understand why the Messiah had to be human? Why the Messiah had to die on the cross more than just, well, duh, of course he did. Uh, so uh, let's let's think about uh, you know the the true humanity of Jesus and why he had to die. So if you don't get this, you don't really get why we need to encourage each other, you know, and how it is that we stand on the day of judgment. And how it is we stand before God right now, and then how it is we stand before God on the day of judgment. Uh, and, and so this is difficult stuff. It's, it's hard to grasp. And so why is it that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins? And how is it that animal sacrifices both forgave sins and didn't forgive sins? Uh, okay, so I, I just want you to, to, to imagine, you know, what it is that God is doing when he tells the people of Israel, when you sin, you need to bring an animal and shed that animal's blood to have your sins forgiven and to stand in the presence of God. Now, there's two ways you can go about doing this. Uh, one, one is to go, yeah, I messed up and... Uh, now I want to go into God's presence and receive God's goodies. So, you know, I'm going to take this animal. And you think about a bull. I, I don't know how much a bull is worth, but I'm just going to throw a number. You know, let's say a few thousand dollars worth of meat. That, that's a pretty significant chunk. Uh, you know, if you're going to sacrifice a bull, you know, for your sin uh, to, to enter God's presence. So you think, you know, I'm going to do this exchange and I give God this bull and then he gives me his presence and I can, I can receive God's goodies. I can go on living my life. Uh, I, I think we're all aware that that attitude, it just doesn't cut it. I mean, do you really think that God is going to, you know, uh, accept a bull so that you can continue to receive his goodies when you have that attitude of rebellion against God? Now consider a, a different attitude where your sin isn't just, oh, I messed up. Oh, and God doesn't like sin. No, no, no. Sin is, it, it takes God's good gifts and says, it gives kind of the middle finger to God and says, well, forget you, God. I can use your gifts way better th than what you say. You know, uh, this is what I want, and this is how I want to use what you've given to me, and I want this and that and the other thing, and you better give them to me because I said so. Uh, no, no, that kind of rebellion against God is a little problematic. Uh, it, it's not just that God won't tolerate it. It's that God cannot tolerate it. And so if you're going to enter into God's presence and receive the goodness that radiates from God, because there's no good that doesn't come from God. And so if you want good things, you better be somewhat near the presence of God. The closer to the presence of God you, you are, you're, you're going to have more goodness. So, so right now we're kind of getting, you know, we're, we're kind of on the edges of God's goodness. And eventually he's going to put an end to that goodness uh, because he says, you know, you're either in or out of my presence. You know, which is it going to be? You know, make a choice. Do you want me and my goodness or don't you? Because it comes from, it's a personal thing. It's not a, some kind of transaction that you can make. Like you give yourself, you give a bull. Now, I want you to imagine you're an Israelite, and you go, whoa, whoa, what I just did is so shocking. How can I possibly continue to be in God's good presence and continue to receive God's good gifts? And God says, oh, hey, here, offer this bull, offer this lamb, offer this goat, for your sin, so you can continue to be in my presence. And you go, how does me spilling the blood of, of that lamb 
bring me into God's presence. And then you realize um, it's him or me. Uh, the wages of sin is death and the life is in the blood. Blood needs to be shed in order for me to be in the presence of God, except it needs to be my blood. And God says, here, shed the blood of this animal instead of you. And so if you realize what's going on in the sacrifice, God is doing something to you to say, this is serious. Your sin, your rebellion against me, it's a problem. It's going to cut you off from my presence. It, it's something that just cannot be tolerated. Uh, you know, if you continue to re rebel against the goodness of God, you're going to be cut off from the goodness of God. So do you want the goodness of God, God's presence, God's face? Except the blood of bulls and goats does not, doesn't do anything. It, it, it's just, if you will, it's something that God says, here, trust here. I, I want you to trust me that a better sacrifice is coming. And it's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And, and here's the thing uh, that, that I think is so important. It, it, it's not that Jesus dies. It's not so much that Jesus dies in your place. It's more that you can join him in his death. Death to your body and the resurrection of the new body, but then also death to your innermost self your deepest desires, your deepest wants, that you're going to change your mind, your thinking, to think God's thoughts after him. You're going to change the choices of your heart to choose God's choices after him in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're going to change your emotions so that now you think about yourself the way God thinks about you. Because I, I want you to think, because there's two things uh, that we need to hold simultaneously in our brain. Okay, when God looks at your sin and your rebellion against him, his response is wrath, anger at corrupting his image, his gifts. This, it ticks God off, and rightly so. And the proper emotional response to that is fear and trembling. You go, uh-oh, I am in deep doo-doo. Yeah, except, you know, it's kind of like knocking at the knees, wetting your pants kind of fear. This is not a popular thought, is it? You know, I can just see people going, that doesn't seem right. How can you not look at God's wrath against your sin and not feel that same disgust and that same wrath and that same fear that you're the object of it? I don't know. Uh, this is the hardest thing in Christianity to believe, by the way. Uh, and it's why I think of it as, you know, my wife said, you didn't preach the good news. And it's like, I preached the wrath of God. And I find that so comforting because I know the gospel. Um, so I did point you to the high priest and to the, who appeals to us on our behalf. Uh, but then there's a second thing that we need to hold simultaneously with the, the fear of God's wrath. And that's his love. That's his concern. And it's the concern of Jesus who says, I'm going to go ahead of you. I'm going to go through death to resurrection. It's Jesus who, who says, hey, Father, Father, here's my little brother. This guy, Steve, him, he, he belongs to me. I, I'm adopting him as my little brother. And he says about you, you're my little brother, you're my little sister. And he says, Father, who represents, who's taking the side of justice and the wrath of God. And Jesus appeals to him on our behalf. He says, hey, I want you to forgive his past and I'm going to guarantee his future, that he is going to become someone who is fitting and right to be in your presence. Because you get the twofold aspect of it. We can't be in the presence of God because of our sin, but then we can't be in the presence of God because we're just mere mortals. Uh, you know, not only have we rebelled against God, but 
we have, we're not fit beings to be in his presence. We, we don't have the maturity. We don't have the, the goodness to be in his presence. And so Jesus vouches for us. He says, Father, I, I want you to just put aside all the wrong that they've done, all their rebellion, put it aside. And then I'm going to walk alongside this person. I'm going to walk alongside my brother, my sister, and I'm going to train them to become like me, to be in your presence. Okay. Both of those are good news. And we tend to just focus on the forgiveness side, the God overlooking our sin. And then we kind of just kind of throw to the wind, you know, it's like, oh, we'll kind of work out, you know, becoming good people, you know, genuinely good people. But it begins right now. You have to be the kind of person who looks at your sin, looks at your rebellion with disgust, with anger, and with fear and trembling. And you have to be the kind of person who says, yeah, I, I want to be like Jesus, which means that the sacrifice we're offering isn't some animal. It, 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 it's joining Jesus right now, right now. And learning to value what he values and to treasure what he treasures, which means an awful lot of going back to the cross, going back to death. And, and there's this other thing uh, with, with, the, with the animal sacrifice, because there, there has to be a sense in which you look at this animal and you go, how does this blood forgive my sins? And you kind of go, how does Jesus' death forgive my sins? I don't know. I just have to believe that it forgives my sins. And then Jesus comes to us with a piece of bread and, and a little, little bit of wine. And, and he goes, hey, this is my body for you. Hey, this is my blood for you. He comes to you and says, hey, pour this water over your head. And I'm going to put my name on you. And you go, uh, okay. That is the childlike trust that grows us into maturity where we see the things of God, God's self-revelation, and we learn to think God's thoughts after him. We learn to choose God's choices after him. We learn to feel God's emotions, true and real emotions, and to do what God does after him. This isn't life application. This is joining the age to come. And it is so counter to everything that this world values and treasures. And you start doing the things this way and people just look at you funny and go, well, that's not the way things work. No, but it will be. <laughs> it will be the way things work in the age to come. So we're going to start living that way right now. And, and that's what's moving beyond immaturity to maturity. What's moving beyond childishness to becoming childlike, which means continual growth and maturity, which means holding on to big brother's hand. <laughs> and saying, hey, Jesus, show me the way. And Jesus goes, okay, it's the way of the cross. And you go, oh, okay. And, and learning to, to, to follow Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and this is good news, right? Good news. Join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus has blazed the trail for us from, from death to life. You know, both, uh, both, death and resurrection, physical death and resurrection, but also that spiritual death and resurrection, death to our hopes and dreams and life of the new age to come, which begins right now in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.